Welcome to the Rhonda Grant Show with your host, Rhonda Grant. If you believe that there is more to life than what you see right now and you want to find out more, listen in as her guests share their journey and their extraordinary experiences. Now, here is your host, Rhonda Grant. Welcome. We are so pleased that you have joined us. It is here that we will uncover if my guest has had extraordinary discoveries in her life. The theme song for the Rhonda Grant Show is Sun on the Water, composed and performed by John Park Wheeler. My guest today is Dr. Marissa Slavin. Marissa has spent the last 30 years taking care of patients and raising her family. She started writing fiction a few years ago and hasn't stopped since. While doing research for her young adult novel about climate change, Marissa became passionate about the environment. She divides her spare time between environmental activism and screenwriting. Join me in welcoming Marissa. Hello, Marissa. Hi, Rhonda. Thanks so much for having me on. Well, it's our pleasure. And so we're going to dive right in and uh, for you to talk to us about climate change and what it's like to be an author. I'm also an author, and I'm always curious of what inspires other authors to write. Can you tell our listeners how it came to pass that you wrote Code Blue? For sure. Um, So I guess I had never thought that I had the capacity to be a writer. I was always a a big reader of both fiction and nonfiction. And uh, it so happened a, a few years back that I took a trip to Paris and I was extremely jet lagged and I couldn't sleep. Um, and while I was up at night, uh, just a, a thought, a story idea came to me and, and it just kept filling out in my mind like, oh, what if this happened? And then that happened. And after a few sleepless nights, I decided, well, I better start writing this down. And so I started writing it. And before I knew it, I had written uh, 70,000 words. And I was like, oh, I didn't know I could do that. Um, awesome. Yeah. So that was sort of my discovery that that I had that in me um, to do that, which was really exciting. And then I took a few writing courses uh, after that. And then I sort of discovered really my passion, not just for writing, but for writing Code Blue. Mm -hmm. And when did you release Code Blue? So um, Code Blue came out uh, initially in 2018. And the publisher was uh, just the most lovely um, publisher you could want, small, but very environmentally focused, so really aligned with what I was trying to do, um, called Moon Willow Press out of Vancouver and allowed me to donate all my uh, proceeds uh, to charity. So that was wonderful and uh, used really friendly, environmentally friendly printing processes for about a year. And then the press shut down. Um, In the meantime, I had written a sequel. And so I approached another publisher, again, looking for one that aligned with my values, with both Code Blue and the sequel Code Red. Um, This publisher was out of Australia, Stormbird Press, um, and was was very pleased to offer me a contract for both books um, and just lovely to work with them. Uh, And then unfortunately, tragedy struck again, um, this time in the form of the wildfires in Australia that destroyed the homes and offices of Stormbird Press. So, yeah, (laughs) initially Code Blue was scheduled for release last spring, um, but because of the the fires, uh, it's actually coming out May 24th. Nice. Uh, Yeah, Code Blue will be available May 24th, and then Code Red will be available in July. Fantastic. So you're releasing two books this year. Yes. That's awesome. So when you were writing the book, did you write the whole book when you were in Paris? No, no, I started. um, And and that was a a previous book uh, that neither of these two books, that was a a book that I ended up self publishing. Oh, uh, sort of my first foray into writing. Um, No, it probably took me a good few months, and then more months of editing and rewriting, etc. 
and, and then I put writing aside for a little while and, and I started writing Code Blue actually because of my daughter. So I have a daughter who is 19 years old now, um, but when she was a younger teen, she used to read a lot of those books um, like Hunger Games and Divergent, sort of dystopian future books where young women were the heroines and they were saving the world. And I was just, I was reading them right along with her because when I was growing up, there were very few books that had young women saving the world. So I was just so thrilled with this and, and so impressed that she had these sort of role models in fiction for feminism. But I got to thinking about you know, these girls save the world because they're brave and they're fast and they can shoot bows and arrows and jump on trains. And I thought, where is the young woman who can save the world because she's smart? Uh, (laughs) Yes. (laughs) And uh, I said, well, you know, if a young woman could save the world because she was smart, what would she save the world from? And I thought, oh, she could save the world from climate change. And then I thought, oh, I better learn something about climate change. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. So that was my inspiration really was to write something for my daughter. And and I think I I find for myself anyways, that often when I write, it's, it ends up that I'm writing for myself, right? Maybe I'm writing to the younger version of myself. Mm -hmm. Um, And I don't know if you've discovered that at all in your writing, but sometimes the messages that we're putting out there for other people are also the messages that we're needing to hear. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the first person that you're telling the story to is yourself, right? And um, so it's wonderful, especially with people who write memoirs, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so why did you, uh, was it because of your daughter that you ended up writing for young adults? Yeah, it was, you know, what, what I discovered was I wanted to write for young adults, especially with a topic like climate change, where I felt like they're the ones who are going to be most affected by it. And they're the ones that we really need to empower to change things. But I think the other thing that I found while I was writing young adult fiction was a lot of older adults also read young adult fiction and it's, it's more accessible to everyone, you know, um, for, for an older adult, a, a young adult novel, maybe a bit of a lighter read um, than your typical fiction, but it makes a difficult topic like climate change much more accessible. So what were your goals in writing the cold? You're, you're, you you kind of have a series yeah. now if you're doing code blue and then code red. Yes. Is there another code? Like how many <laughs> books are going to be in your series? There definitely could be more. I think we'll we'll see how these two do first. And then if uh, if they do well enough and the publisher would like me to write more books in the series, I certainly would be happy to do that. Um, I think we've got some some really interesting side characters. But I, I don't guess want to commit too much until uh, we see sort of what direction this goes. Typically, it takes me about a year and a half to write a novel. Um, so it's a big time commitment, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, it sure is. Yeah. Um, unless you get up really early in the morning before you start your real day. Right. And so you're in the healthcare profession. And so when you wrote Code Blue, did, is code blue synonymous with what code blue is in the healthcare? Yeah, yeah, great right? question, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. So in healthcare, code blue is when somebody's uh, heart stops or they stop breathing, and they'll call a code blue either overhead or on pagers to let the the rescue team know they need to come and start CPR and intubation and, and all of that. Um, so that's what a code blue is medically, is, is a cardiac or respiratory arrest. Um, And in terms of the book and and climate change, I felt like, um, you know, what happens medically when when somebody is sort of at that tipping point is it really can go either way. It's possible that they'll be resuscitated um, and, and come back either as good as they were before or come back different than they were. And it's possible that you're not going to make it through. Mm-hmm. I felt very much that that's sort of the situation the world is in with climate change. Um, and especially, I mean, in, in my novel, it's set a little bit in the future. So, so uh, they kind of don't know how things are going to go um, in terms of 
people's ability to continue to live on the earth, um, for it to remain habitable uh, for humanity. Mm-hmm. And, and, so, mm-hmm. and code red. Yes, I was going to say, so <laughs> if that if that's code blue, what's code right. red? Yeah, so code red is when there's a fire. Um, so in a hospital, if they call it code red, it means there's a fire somewhere. And they'll okay. follow it up in, you know, by telling you where it is in the hospital, which floor, or cafeteria, wherever. Um, and so in the, the, the second book in the series uh, deals a fair bit with, with wildfires. And what's the significance of wildfires? Well, what, you know, wildfires, it's really interesting because uh, I think it depends very much where you live, what your interpretation of uh, the climate crisis is. But one of the things that really affects almost all of us, no matter where we live, are the wildfires. So it obviously mm-hmm. affects people who live close by in terms of their, uh, their homes, their, their lives, their property, and, and all of that. I mean, luckily, most people are able to be evacuated. But, um, but also wildfires can be uh, devastating in terms of crops and food, which, you know, we, we all need. Um, and it's lovely to be able to source our food locally, but practically a lot of our food comes from places that are at great risk of, uh, damage from wildfires. So it's really a huge impact to everybody when there's wildfires. Mm -hmm. Not to mention, um, the devastation of wildlife as well. Oh, yeah, huge, huge devastation of wildlife. What does wildfires have to do with climate change? Mm -hmm, Sure. So, I mean, wildfires uh, can occur and often do occur naturally. Um, So, you know, hopefully uh, not too many are are set by people, although sometimes they are, sometimes Mm -hmm. intentionally and sometimes unintentionally. But the thing is how it relates to climate change and what we see since the climate crisis is that wildfires are getting much bigger, much more out of control, much more devastating than they than they used to be, you know, five years, 10 years, 20 years ago. And the reason for that is, is several fold. Um, one is that uh, a lot of the conditions are much, much drier. Um, And that, again, relates back to climate change and where the moisture and humidity go and where they don't go anymore. So we've got a lot more moisture and humidity on the coastlines. The other huge issue in terms of wildfires is uh, insects and especially things like, for example, pine beetles. Um, These are insects that eat trees and kill trees. So now the trees are dead and they're much more likely to catch fire. And the these insects used to be killed when the weather got colder. And now that it's never getting as cold, that it's warmer, longer, the insects have a much longer feeding time. And so they kill way more trees. They've spread into regions where they never were before. And so lots of trees are dying and are are just set for kindling with anything that happens. Wow, I had no idea. And, you know, of course, I mean, there's a huge loss of trees and and vegetation that act to pull carbon dioxide out of our atmosphere. So it just contributes to the, the climate crisis getting worse when we're losing the best, most biological systems that we have to decrease the carbon dioxide in, in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And going back to Code Red, what uh, did you talk about in your book or how can you explain to our listeners uh, what is happening um, with uh, the climate change? Yeah, so... I think a lot of times when people think about climate change, it can seem really intimidating. Like if you don't have a science background and even, I mean, I came from a medical science background, but you know, I didn't know anything about this. And so you think like, how can I possibly understand this? And I'll tell you the, the easiest way to understand it um, is if, if you think about like at night when you're in bed and if you put on one blanket, that helps you to stay warm. And if you put on two blankets, three blankets, four blankets, pile on the blankets, you get hotter and hotter and hotter, right? And everybody's had that experience and can relate to that. And when we think about climate change, that's the, the, the exact same thing applies in that the atmosphere around the earth 
is our blanket. It's, you know, outer space is, is very, very cold. I mean, I don't know the temperature, but it's freezing in outer space, right? And, and the earth is warm and we can live on it because we've got this blanket of atmosphere that when the sun rays come in, they stay in because we've got the atmospheric blanket. When we put more and more carbon dioxide and, and methane in the atmosphere, it's like adding blankets on. So the, the temperature of the earth gets warmer and warmer. Um, and some places it gets warmer by just a few degrees and other places it gets much warmer. And it sort of goes into sort of a vicious cycle of the warmer it gets, the warmer it's likely to get. So it causes melting of ice caps. And, you know, this is okay. Totally honest. Before I got into it, I used to think climate change. Oh, people care about the polar bears because there's no ice for them to live on. And you, and I'm like, I don't freaking care about polar bears. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they might look cute in a cartoon, but I think they're actually pretty vicious. And not that I don't care about animals, but it was not like my top priority. So when I start to go into like, oh, mel- melting ice caps, it always sort of catches me and brings me back to, well, why should we care if the ice caps are melting, right? Yes. And, right. And, and we care because when the sea level rises, it means that every city and every person who lives anywhere near a coastline, when there's a, a hurricane or a flood, they're that much more at risk because the sea level, sea level has risen. Um, and so all those melting ice, the Antarctic, it impacts everybody who lives on a coastline and around the world, millions and millions of people live on coastlines. I mean, not just North America, but in, in uh, Africa and Asia, um, it's just devastating. And it's starting to rise. It is. And it's rising much faster than they thought a few years ago than they ever thought that it would. Mm -hmm. And Miami, Florida, I mean, it's scary to fly in when we used to be able to fly in, yeah. uh, fly into Miami, because a lot of it is underwater. I know, it's, I know. And it's, it's getting worse. But take us back to how are we contrib- how are, are the humans on our earth contributing to what's going on here? Yeah, for sure. So you know, I think for a long time, we've been telling ourselves a certain story about how we interact with the planet and that there are sort of endless and infinite resources that are ours for the taking and the making. And every time we interact with the planet in that way, we have the potential to do harm. So what I mean is, you know, I think the the obvious things that people see are things like gasoline for your car or to heat your house. Um, Mm -hmm. But anything that's made of plastic is also made from uh, oil. Oil. So all Mm -hmm. plastics come from oil. And when we look at the, the state of agriculture in most of the world now, it's largely these huge mega farms where they, they put tons of nitrogen um, and poison into the soil for growing the plants or for the animals. Um, So there's sort of all sorts of devastating ways that we've come into in the last uh, several decades, um, certainly since the Industrial Revolution, but it seems to have sped up a lot in the last few decades. And it can feel totally overwhelming and helpless and hopeless when you think about that. It's like, well, what are we supposed to do? Like change our whole lifestyle? <laughs> like, can you yeah. imagine a world with no plastic and no, no, no oil to heat your home? And, and it's, it's just hard to imagine that. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and so that's number one, what, what, we need to do is to tell different stories and to imagine a different future for ourselves and a much more holistic way of being in the world. And it doesn't mean that we have to give up everything and, and, you know, go back to the dark ages or become cavemen or, or anything like that. Um, There are so many different solutions that already exist that we could implement that would benefit everybody um, if we had the willpower to do it. And one of the things that, that I'm coming to realize is it's, it's so hard for an individual to feel like 
they have any power to do anything about this, you know, Mm -hmm. that's Uh, what I'm see, that's what I'm thinking is that sometimes when things are so big, so out of control, yeah, uh, how, what can I do? Right? Oh, totally. And if and if I can do that every day, yeah, you times it by the amount of people that are on the earth. Um, and I mean, some of the underdeveloped countries, they can't do anything about their situation. Um, I mean, they're living in survival, and they're not thinking about and don't know about yeah. what maybe, right? Yeah. Yeah. What's going on with the earth? But how can I help? Absolutely. So you know, there's, a, there's many things that we can do as individuals to um, impact our own carbon footprint, as they call it. Yes. But and, and I'll share some of those with you. But what I what I honestly truly believe is it's not an individual's responsibility to fix this. It's not mine and it's not yours and it's certainly not as you mentioned the poor people who are just struggling to survive it's not any of our responsibilities to fix this this is a global problem and we need our our lawmakers our politicians our institutions the corporations which are now as powerful as the politicians those are the things that need to change not me and not you but the people who make the rules, you know, I'm sure you've heard of Al Gore, right? And his, mm-hmm. uh, and he said it's more important to change laws than light bulbs, and and that's how we see the difference. And so, if you said, well, what's the one thing that that I can do? I'd say make sure that you vote for someone who cares about the climate, because that's that's going to be the most impactful thing. Is we're so lucky to live in a democracy. We need to make our voices heard and at every level, you know, I mean, it could be a federal level, a provincial or state level, even in municipal elections, like cities have tremendous ability to make uh, laws and bylaws that have impact on the climate and, and on the environment right around you. So become politically active, vote, help other people learn how to vote contact your your local representatives um hopefully when we we don't have covid anymore then we can uh, have some protests and marches and that's another way of letting our our politicians and our institutions know what's important to us as as individuals um so that that would be my number one thing that i would say uh i'd encourage everybody who has the the freedom and the ability to do that to, to pursue that um otherwise certainly you know you can educate yourself and you can educate yourself through lots of nonfiction mediums, but also through fiction as a way of educating, right? Um, so every little thing that you do to learn more about the situation might put an idea in your head of like, oh, but I could do this or I know about this and and find a way to help. And all of us have a way to help, not only with our, our votes, but also with whatever our talents are. So if your talent is in the media, then helping to spread the word is a really important thing that you can do. If, if my talent is in writing fiction and telling stories, then that's what I can do. Um, and we each need to think about what our own special talent is and how we can use that to help everyone. That's wonderful. And what I really like is that uh, the schools have been um, teaching generations now to recycle and, mm-hmm. and all of that. And, and I, I really think that makes a big am, impact as well. And uh, there's people that collect um, bottles on the side of the road or whatever uh, for do, doing fundraisers for, yeah. to help a, a cause. And I mean, types of things like that. And so how can a household, mm-hmm. um, how can a, a whole household help Um, the overall picture. Sure, definitely. No, you're so right. I mean, the schools have been doing a great job. They teach kids the three R's, right? Reduce, reuse, and recycle. So the most important thing you can do is reduce. Reduce uh, the unnecessary things that you're buying. Reduce food waste is huge in North America. The amount of energy that goes into growing our food and transporting our food and refrigerating our food, if 
if any household can reduce their food waste, that in itself makes a huge contribution. So think about, you know, uh, reducing your consumption, especially reducing food waste, reusing whenever you can, you know, uh, for us, it's, it, we've always been people who liked going to thrift stores, but it's now become like a really popular thing with teenagers. Actually, thrifting is very, yes, in, so. it is. Yeah. <laughs> So thrifting is awesome. Um, reduce, reuse, and then recycle. And again, it, recycling is somewhat dependent on living in a municipality that's on board to, to do the recycling, right? Because I myself can't recycle my plastic, but my municipality can. And, you know, I, I'm very happy. I live in a place where they do composting as well. So I put my compost out with the rest of my stuff and the city takes it away and composts it and turns it into to fertilizer. Um, so those are all really great things that that households can do. Um, our biggest single uh, individual footprints often relate to airplane travel. So mm-hmm. that's that's been something we've all had to uh, curtail of late. And uh, I, I guess we're all looking forward to getting back on planes and going places, but being mindful of how many things we can do without needing to go on an airplane, right? Like people used to travel so much for work and now we're discovering like, oh, you actually don't need to travel for work. You can do it from home if you have to. So there's a lot of things that we can do to reduce uh, our energy consumption in that way. Eating less meat because a lot more energy goes into producing meat than into producing fruits and vegetables and grains. So if you can eat less meat, even if you just cut back a little bit, any of that is very, very helpful. Whatever little bit people can do. You know, it sounds overwhelming. We're supposed to, according to the UN uh, and the Paris Climate Agreement, decrease uh our CO2 admissions by 50% in 10 years. And that sounds like a lot, but it's actually Mm -hmm. only 5% a year. So could you eat 5% less meat? Could you travel 5% less this year than last year? Oh, that doesn't sound so overwhelming. I think I could do five and you know, keep house half a degree cooler in the winter and, and half a degree warmer in the summer. And if you just take it in small chunks like that and say, well, I can do my 5% this year. This is what I'm going to do this year to reduce my consumption by 5%. You just need to keep doing that and building on it each year, another 5%. But, you know, again, it's, 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 good for people to do something and to feel empowered rather than hopeless. But it comes back to having those things available too, like, you know, having subsidies for electric cars and having enough charging stations, um, having stores that, that sell things that are not in plastic containers all the time. All of that is beyond an individual's control, right? Mm -hmm. And they are making bags now that, um, are not plastic. They actually are good. They're okay for the environment. Yeah. Um, But what I found with the pandemic is that uh, more and more people are staying at home and they're working from home and zoom was developed and we're on a zoom call right now. And so people um, are not in their offices, which means they're not driving their vehicle to the office Uh, they're staying home. And uh, so that has reduced during the pandemic. I mean, it's incredible how much we've reduced the emissions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and And, so the other the other amazing thing to me about the pandemic is it really shows worldwide what we can do when there's a will to do it, you know, I mean, how quickly the vaccines were developed and, and cooperation between countries and, and between scientists. Um, and so sometimes we think, well, you know, we're only one country or one whatever, what can we do? But look, when the world wants to do something, when it's meaningful, the world can act together and can act quickly and forcefully um, in the face of scientific evidence, right? Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. So is this the extraordinary discovery that you have found in your life? It's what I like to ask my guests. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's sort of serendipitous how you uh, started thinking about uh, this um, 
idea and you at the time you didn't know that you uh, were writing a book because you were writing it in your head yeah. and uh, and all of a sudden um, you've discovered uh, a cause that you are passionate about talk to us about that yeah, absolutely. You know, I I, I think um, writing is is definitely sort of my happy place, um, and and I lucked into that into finding something that that I can do that I just I'm in the zone, and when I'm writing, time flies, and and I I don't even know how much time has gone by, and I'm just so happy and energized. But as you said, serendipitously, I also found not just my happy place, but I found my passion in terms of the cause of of the climate crisis and how this is a way that, you know, I think we all need to be there for one another and do what we can to help people near and far and, and to help the future generations and to, to help the animals and, and all the other <laughs> all the other living things that we're destroying mm-hmm. along the way that are absolutely have no responsibility for this at all, and yet they're being wiped out too. Oh yes, it's a, it's at rapid rates. And what people don't realize, if you take one of those animals out of the chain, it affects all of the other animals uh, that are in the line with them. Yeah, so true. So true. Yeah. Yeah. How many people contact you? Like when your book, come, where is your book going to be available? I, I guess that sure. would be the, the first <laughs> the first question. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So my book will be available um, on Amazon, for sure. And at my publisher's website, so you can order direct from the publisher. The publisher is Stormbird Press. So it's S-T-O-R-M-B-I-R-D-P-R-E-S-S dot com. Um, and uh, so you can get it either of those two places. When bookstores start to open up again, I'm going to have it some, I like to support my local independent bookstores. Mm-hmm. Um you know, more than sort of the big chains. Oh, wonderful. That's wonderful. Do you feel that you've been called to this work? I mean, you've already been called because you're in the medical profession and you, um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, of course. So I think from, from my perspective, my calling in the medical profession was very much about wanting to help others and feeling like, um, you know, every job that you do, doesn't matter what it is, there's going to be bad days, and there's going to be things about it you don't like. But if you feel that you're helping somebody else, then it makes the bad part of the job worthwhile. Um, And, you know, within medicine, I practice palliative care. um, So I care for people who are living uh, with terminal illness and, and for their families as well. And again, I, I, I felt uh, immediately uh, called to that when I discovered it, that this was a place where people were suffering and where I could help them, um, perhaps the last chance to resolve sort of any of their suffering while they're in this world and, and how impactful that is for their family as well to, to have their loved one not suffer. So that was, you know, that was my calling that I've, I've been so happy with for the last 30 years. And I think the calling to climate change bears a lot of resemblance to palliative care, you know, Uh, it's a calling that's really to me about helping other people um, by seeing what what's happening by acknowledging that something difficult is happening and saying, well, even if this difficult thing, whether it's our own mortality or whether it's the climate crisis, even though this is happening, what can we do to make things as good as they can be, to make things a little bit better than they are if we do nothing? Um, and I truly believe that's what we're all here for is, is to help one another. That's beautiful. What a tender time that we've had uh, talking about this, because uh, a lot of it is uh, life and death. And when we don't face it every day, uh, we don't uh, appreciate it and take action on on certain things. 
So because you're in that care, caring for people at the end of their life, as you say, you live that that's what you live. And it's so relative, because we're trying to save our planet, uh, the best way we know how. And uh, you've been so instructive, you have a vast knowledge about what you're talking about. And I'm so pleased that uh, we've had this chance to uh, let our listeners know uh, about exactly what's going on from a person who is into it. Like <laughs> if you're into your knees, you're up to your yeah, neck. And yeah. I mean, there's no <laughs> going back. And I mean, you're the walking, talking example, really, of um, of what you write about. And uh, so I so appreciate it. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to uh, talk about before we wrap up? We're going to wrap up here shortly. Um, yeah, I just uh, I want to take it uh, not a bit lighter, but but just to emphasize that that the books Code Blue and Code Red are they are fiction. Now all the science in them is real and based on real science, but they're really meant to entertain and engage. Uh, as much or more so than to instruct. They're not preachy books at all. There's, you know, the teenage girl and the boarding school and the boyfriend and the best friend and the dog and the adventures. And the, Oh, it's fun. Oh, yeah. oh my God. <laughs> you know? And the mystery and the thrill and the, the uh, so there's tons of action going on. There's some romance, there's tons of action and, um, and, and it's just, uh, it's just fun. And if you learn a little bit something while you're reading the book, that's awesome. And if you just read it and have fun, that's awesome, too. Well, what a legacy. Uh, it's just fantastic. Thank you so much um, for joining us, uh, Marissa. Uh, you're an extraordinary guest. And I'm so pleased that uh, we've met virtually and that uh, I've, able to, I've been able to interview you. Oh, it's my absolute pleasure, Rhonda. Thank you so much for having me on. You're welcome. This is Rhonda Grant with The Rhonda Grant Show, author of Magical Forces Within, Extraordinary Discoveries in an Ordinary Life, inviting you to look for the magical forces within yourself today and every day. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for tuning in to The Rhonda Grant Show with your host, Rhonda Grant. If you would like to find out more information about Rhonda and her upcoming guests and the work that she does, go to her website, rondagrantauthor.com. That's rondagrantauthor.com. 